Pennsylvania's state system of higher education, 14 universities, infinite opportunities. This week we explore the opportunities available at Westchester University. First, we'll hear from Interim University President Christopher Ferentino. Hello, I'm Frank Brogan, Chancellor of Pennsylvania's State System of Higher Education, and welcome to yet another installment of Infinite Opportunities, our chance as a state university system to proudly discuss and help educate people in the Commonwealth about the important work taking place on our 14 campuses all over the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We're very pleased today to have a special guest, Interim President of Westchester University, Dr. Chris Ferentino. Dr. Ferentino acquired three degrees, undergraduate and graduate, from Temple University before moving on as an assistant professor at Westchester University in the College of Business and Public Affairs. After serving in that capacity for a number of years, he moved into the position of Dean of the College of Business and Public Affairs, serving there with great distinction until being tapped as the Vice President for External Operations for the institution. He has done so much on behalf of Westchester and therefore on behalf of our state university system, and yet his job was not yet complete. He was asked most recently to serve as the interim president of Westchester following the retirement of longtime president Greg Weisenstein. So he is overseeing that university at a very important time in a very important transitional period. Welcome to our program today, Dr. Ferentino, and congratulations on your appointment. Thank you very much, Chancellor Brogan. I'm delighted to be here and happy to talk about Westchester University. Well, I know you are, and we've talked about Westchester, you and I, a great deal, not only prior to being tapped as interim president, but certainly since you've become interim president. And we're delighted with the job that you're doing overseeing that university and truly helping it through one of the more important transitions in university history. You, of course, take up the reins from Greg Weisenstein, who was the longtime president at Westchester, who has since retired from his post. and. Uh, are now leading the charge into the future for the institution, not only long term, but especially during this critically important transitionary period. Can you tell us, please, Dr. Ferentino, a little bit about Westchester University? Certainly. Well, Westchester has, has uh, a long history, like most of the, the state system universities. Uh, 1871 was, was our founding as a normal school. Uh, we, we had a long tradition as, as uh, a preparer of educators. Uh, as we move th through the process of becoming a state college and eventually a, a university, uh, we, we continued the strength in education, became very well known for programs in music, physical education, and that really had been what we were known for. Uh, really uh, until the, the system uh, in 1983 was launched, and at that point, we really started to branch out and, and spread our strength into other areas. Since that time, we've developed great strength in, in business, in, in uh, the, the sciences, in the health sciences, uh, and other areas. Nursing, we have a very strong nursing program. And uh, at this point, we enroll about just short of 17,000 students. We've grown quite a bit. Uh, we're in the, the suburban Philadelphia region, which is a, a, a great region to be in. There are a lot of colleges and universities, over 80, but we have good demographics and uh, strong recruiting, and we're, we're still able to, to even under the, the current circumstances with college age population really stabilizing or declining, we're able to, to attract a, a significant uh, applicant pool to select from. Well, I, I use the phrase interim president. Uh, I tell my friends, I've even told you, the fact that in my career in education, which is almost 40 years uh, long, I have always managed to duck the title interim anything because it's a very unique and because it is unique, a difficult role to fulfill. Uh, one has to keep a steady hand on the tiller, 
during the transitionary period on one hand to try to hold down and tamp down the, the distraction so people can remain focused on teaching and learning, but at the same time, continue to move the university forward in an upward trajectory. It's a delicate balance. Can you tell us a little bit about what you have found? Uh, I know you're still rather early on as the interim, but what kinds of things have you found in that capacity that you'd like to share? Well, it's, a, it's certainly a very interesting job, and it, I start on April 1st, so it's been just short of three months at this point, but it sure seems like it's been longer than that. Uh, you're right, it, it's a delicate balance when, when a president who's been at the institution for a long time leaves. There's a great deal of uncertainty, anxiety on the campus, what's going to happen next. Uh, to some extent, it's, it's possible to just maintain the status quo. But in the dynamic world that we find ourselves in at this point, we really can't afford to, to sit by and, and uh, wait for something to happen. So we're proceeding. Uh, I, I have a long history at Westchester. I know the institution well. I have a strong cabinet that I'm working with. And, and we're proceeding with the, the future plans of the institution. Uh, the, the search process, presidential search processes, take longer than a lot of people might realize. Uh, we have to be sensitive to things like the summertime when the, a lot of the faculty are away from campus. Uh, we, we typically uh, engage a, a consultant to do the recruiting. So the process can take six months or more. Uh, our hope is that we'll be able to complete the process by uh, December of this year and then have a permanent president in place sometime in the spring, perhaps as, as late as July 1, but that would be the process. Well, we're very excited about the future of Westchester University, obviously. We know you are, too. Can you tell me a little bit about the academic program? That's the heart and soul of every institution of higher education. Well, I, I alluded to a couple of things. We, we have really ex expanded our programs. Uh, one of the things that we focused on, uh, I, I mentioned education, we've had a, a nationally accredited uh, education program since the 50s, and one of our goals was to go out and achieve accreditation in other areas. We have uh, AACSB accreditation for business, we have ABET accreditation for computer science, uh, and a whole host of, of nationally or internationally accredited programs. Nursing is a particular strength for us. We, we really have had great success there, and, and we've expanded in other health sciences. Uh, we have a pharmaceutical products development program that has been uh, really meeting a need for our region. We have a very strong pre-med program, a very high, high success rate in placing our, our science majors in medical programs. And one of the areas that we've been expanding significantly has been in distance education, primarily at the master's level. We find that the professional master's degrees, the demand for our type of institution is to have the flexibility of, of a, an online or a hybrid program. We've seen great growth in the area of, of the MBA in business. Uh, we've added programs in psychology, uh, in, in uh, criminal justice, a hybrid program. Uh, we have a recent program that we've launched in nutrition. Uh, we've, been, we've tried to be selective to make sure that we're looking at programs that are high demand in our region. Mm -hmm. We have uh, one we're hoping to have approved coming up uh, at the next Board of Governors meeting, which, which is a Master of Science in Human Resources, which is in very high demand. So we're very excited about that program. And these are generally online programs, the one I, ones I've been listing. Uh, overall, uh, enrollment growth at the graduate level has, has continued, actually surprisingly, a little bit uh, because it hasn't really been growing nationally. And one of the big exciting things is we've moved into some professional doctorates in, in selected areas, education, psychology, nursing, uh, and, and a few other areas that we're looking at. We feel we have particular strengths in those areas and there is a strong market in our region for some of those programs. Well, I think that having an economist in these very difficult economic times that we face, not only in Pennsylvania but throughout the country, gives us a little greater comfort level that the future of Westchester uh, in terms of the business model will continue to be strong and 
vibrant, but I also know as an academic, uh, you are uh, important to that institution in your leadership as it relates to the creation and the continuation of wonderful, high quality academic programs for the students who are there now and the students who will participate with Westchester in the future. We could talk all day about wonderful Westchester University, Dr. Ferentino, but uh, I wish you incredible success there. Your success is the success of Westchester, uh, and we wish you nothing but the best. We thank you for stepping up and accepting the mantle of interim president of the institution at a very important time in the evolution of Westchester University. And today, thank you for joining us and sharing your thoughts with the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Chester Brogan, it's been my pleasure. <clears throat> As I said, I enjoy talking about Westchester. We believe we have a great future. And uh, it's great to be part of the state system of higher education. Coming up next, explore more opportunities offered at Westchester University. Invest in me. 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 I'll be your future public servant. I'll be your future advertising executive. I'll be your future accountant. I will be your future motivational speaker. I'll be your future lawmaker. I will be your future teacher. Invest in me. I'll be your future videographer. Welcome back to Infinite Opportunities. Next, we'll meet a Westchester University professor who studied DNA to show how, even though people are diverse, they're also the same. My name is Anita Foman, and I've been at Westchester since uh, 1982. And uh, my area of specialization is both organizational communication and intercultural communication. I went to uh, an undergraduate school in Ohio, Defiance College, and then I went to Temple University for my master's and my PhD. I'm actually from uh, Philadelphia originally, so it was sort of odd to be in the Midwest. The whole cultural thing came together because as a person who was from the city and from the East Coast, Ohio was like a different <laughs> land for me. So it was my real first cross-cultural extended cross-cultural experience. And the interesting thing was, in my growing up, in, during the time that I grew up, people would often say to me, oh, you speak beautifully. And I didn't really know what that meant. I learned later that it had to do with my race, that people didn't expect for me to speak sort of standard English. And when they said, you speak beautifully, it was related to that. So um, that was that came together in terms of studying speech and communication and uh, my interest in my field. Almost a decade ago, the Multicultural Faculty Commission had a little bit of money and they said if anybody wanted to apply for funds to study something that was you know, innovative or forward thinking in terms of diversity, that you could apply for these funds. And I had already started thinking about the whole issue of race and the social construction of race. And, and that these conversations were not happening at the time. And almost all of the conversation would deteriorate to a conversation about black people and white people as if they were totally different and, and as if no other groups existed. And I thought, we have to have a way to have another kind of conversation. And so I was interested in race, and, and I had already been writing literature on um, interracial families. And with the idea that, again, just as African Americans and organizations are not a problem, that interracial families are not a problem. So when I applied for the grant from the Multicultural Faculty Commission, I asked if I could use these brand new DNA tests that were coming out that said that they could tell you something about your ancestry. And so um, I wanted to test three people, one of whom identified as white, 
one of whom identified as black and one of whom identified as multiracial. And of course you found for the white, the black, and the um, mixed background person that they had many things in their background. And that was really where I was going with this in my own head. There were still theories around that suggested that different races like came from different origins. And, and the, the theory of the human trek that we all came from, from sub-Saharan Africa and that we're all you know, of the same family, those were new theories when, you know, when I was first talking about this. So at any rate now, almost 10 years later, um, we have tested almost actually more than 700 people and have started a real discussion about what we share in our ancestry. And I think that developing new narratives that are beyond we're so different that we couldn't possibly get along is really the way out. And, and the United States is, is in an important place in the conversation because we're a country made up of people of all kinds of backgrounds. I think oftentimes uh, when we talk about diversity, there's a tendency to think it belongs to some people and it doesn't belong to other people. But because everybody has DNA, everybody has humanity. And so part of the, the idea is that everybody is part of the conversation of, of diversity. It doesn't belong to this group or that group and not this group or that group. The world is not going to fall apart if we address these issues. And what's more, there's an opportunity for us to create a world that we all can be honored in and we all can feel that we're a part of. And so I think this, this is a small step, but it's an important step in, in giving us all a stake in this. I, in particular, have just gotten an incredible amount of support from Westchester, my colleagues, to my chairperson, to my dean, to the public relations department, to the foundation. I mean, if there's anything that I have wanted to do, I just have felt that somebody says, how can we support you? And I would just say, I cannot believe that I've had the career that I've had. I realized that my great grandmother was born into slavery. I've got a PhD and I'm teaching at a great school and I have opportunities that, you know, just wouldn't have been imaginable. That's not that long. And, and I guess for me, it says how important a high quality education is. And I hope that I share that value of education with my students, with every single student I have. Next, we'll discover how physical activity and nutrition programs at Westchester help various groups throughout the community. All of my work deals with school-aged youth. The Center for Healthy Schools started five years ago here at the university, and we are a core connector between public and non-public schools, community groups, and our focus is healthy students and also linked to academic success and learning. In past, approaches have always been that health issues of kids stayed with the typical health practitioner, a school nurse, a physician, like a sort of traditional model. Um, as kids' health issues became really more complicated, it was really obvious that um, we had to look at the impact that was having on kids doing well in schools. So the center's job is to merge the conversation so that when we're talking about a healthy school, we're looking at health and wellness strategies as a means to student test scores improving, to kids being able to come to school and not miss school, to increasing graduation rates, Healthy kids we know are better learners. It's like really a, a simple idea. You know, people talk about legacies or um, making a difference, and to me it's always been making a, a difference in somebody's life in terms of their health, and then the impact that has on their ability to be successful in school, to graduate, have the career they want, the family, whatever it is that they plan for their future. Health is such a great determinant of your success in being able to do that, so it's very personal. So for me, it's kind of easy to be motivated and feel rewarded just because of the impact you know you've made. I'm a speech-language pathologist, and before I became a speech-language pathologist, I was a singer. I actually took a course as a senior called Care of the Professional Voice, and it was taught by a speech-language pathologist, and I said, this is what I have to be doing. The largest group of people who've been studied in my field are teachers, and there's a large prevalence of teachers who have voice problems. 
And so there's been studies that looked at the societal impact, the economic impact, actually the students' learning abilities and how they're impacted in the classroom. So I'm actually looking at designing a telepractice model for voice disorders related to teachers. And I'm actually doing that here at Westchester University with student teachers. And I'm gonna compare that online model to a traditional in-person model. You know, the grant that I've applied for is an Area R15. It stands for the Academic Research Enhancement Award. And that grant is meant to encourage student involvement. The students are involved in helping me to do the research. So I have undergraduate students as well as graduate students in the first year. Undergraduate students are helping me design the app, pilot the app, test the app, put it all together. The second and third years of the grant, graduate students are going to help me with the telepractice and the in-person model. It's our job to, as speech-language pathologists, to think about how we can encourage community people to you know, use their voice to the best of their ability to prevent problems the desire to help people uh, improve their voice is, you know, prompted me to go into the field. I feel that my lot in life, if you want to call it, is to help people become empowered through physical activity, nutrition education, and wellness activities. When I graduated from college, I went right on to my master's, and that's when I realized I really wanted to help people with disabilities because they seemed like they were marginalized. And when I started to look at people who were very successful, actually like maybe in wheelchair sports, those people had much more control of their lives. They felt empowered, they felt like they were self-determined, and they were able to do many more things because of their involvement in physical activity. That's kind of where we started the Adapted Physical Activity programs. And we started on Wednesday nights with nine children in the gym and nine graduate students. That program has grown tremendously. We have 45 children with disabilities and 45 Westchester students who come together for 75 minutes and we do cooperative games, fitness, motor skills, pre-sports, sports skills, and then I kind of branched out. When one of my colleagues, Kat Ellis, came on board about seven years ago, we started then a program on Monday nights for transition age youth. Three or four years ago, we got our colleague Jeannie Subak involved, and what she does at the end of that night is she teaches a nutrition lesson to 20 young people with cognitive disabilities. So we brought in the nutrition piece. So we have a program on Monday nights with 20 young adults with cognitive disabilities and 20 Westchester students. Then Dr. Subak comes in and does a nutrition lesson and she brings six or seven of her nutrition majors. And that's really a, a pretty solid training ground for people who are going into health and PE teacher cert and then pre-physical therapy and pre-occupational therapy. The programs have made a significant impact on Westchester students' lives, like nobody's business. It's really something. But I think that I'd like to attract more WCU students to take the classes, to be volunteers in the program, and in general to transform more students' lives. Every time at the end of every, every week, every program, my students just have this glow about them that they were part of something way bigger than themselves. Next, we'll learn about Westchester University programs that they've created to directly benefit their local community. When I got here in, in 2009, one of the features of Westchester University that attracted me to this position was the Center for Social and Economic Policy Research. At the time, it was directed by Dr. Lorraine Bernatsky, who's currently the interim provost. Both her and Dr. Chris Ferentino, who is then dean of the College of Business and Public Affairs, really identified a need for um, the community to be able to access the research services at the institution. Both Dr. Ferentino and Dr. Bernatsky created the Center for Social and Economic Policy Research with an, an intent and a mission to provide the surrounding communities with access to research services that are staffed by the high quality faculty at Westchester University. So we have worked with organizations uh, such as the 21st Century Partnership for STEM Education. Their goal was to 
identify new and innovative math curricula that had an impact both on student learning uh, within the secondary education system, but also post-secondary. So we, we partnered with them on a, a National Sciences Foundation grant, and it, the study went really well. We've also been in, involved with um, making um, poverty history for Chester County. We've worked with the United Way and some of their strategic planning efforts. We recently worked with the County of Chester in ensuring that their most recent strategic plan was meeting the needs and demands of citizens. We've really worked with any number of organizations across the spectrum from public, private, and nonprofit. And in each of those instances, our, our goal was to leverage the resources here at Westchester University, the high quality faculty, students, and ensure that our community was receiving the full benefit of having an institution of higher learning in their backyard. We're very lucky that the center is closely connected with the Master of Public Administration program and our students are receiving real life experience working as evaluators, working as researchers um, on these projects with nonprofits. So these experiences provide our students with a, a tangible work product that had a meaningful impact on their community and they're able to, to leverage that to gain uh, meaningful employment. There will now be two parallel organizations at Westchester University uh, serving the needs of our community. There, there will re remain the Center for Social and Economic Policy Research, which will be focused on serving these nonprofit and corporate needs um, in terms of research needs. And then there will be the Center for Community Solutions that's, that's just launched this year uh, under the leadership of Chris Ferentino. It was an idea of, of Mayor Carolyn Kamita and President Greg Weisenstein, they, they got together and wanted to understand how do, they, how do they ensure that the strong community bonds and ties and relationships sustain themselves after President Weisenstein leaves, after Mayor Committee's term is up, and they, they really brought this, this concept to life of the Center for Community Solutions. I'm Chris Fiorentino, I'm the Vice President for External Operations at Westchester University. When the uh, External Operations Division was created, the Community Solutions center was was placed here so it was our responsibility to actually launch it and it's it's essentially based on the fact that a university has a, a huge array of experts both at, both in academic programs and in, uh, in administrative positions and we are part of the community and part of our responsibility in the community is, is to have economic impact, support economic development, and so the, the center is really intended to focus on that. A community that has a university, when it has community issues, should always think about how the university could help address those issues. So we're trying to make, uh, make it uh, easier for people in the community to know who to contact at the university if they have something that they're interested in discussing with us. We, we want to be able to be good citizens in the community. We want the community to see having a university as, as a valuable thing. So we have this great ethic of, of, of volunteerism. Our students, uh, we, we have a record, the president speaks often about the student volunteerism and the latest information is that this past year we had over 900,000 hours working on a, a wide array of projects, reading support, identifying and eradicating hunger, on and on and on. One of the beauties, one of the, one of the synergies of these kinds of things is that these are opportunities for students to engage in, in learning experiences, applying what it is that they're learning in their classes. It's an opportunity for faculty to apply their expertise to real world, pro world problems which can sharpen their skills. So it's, it's not just us giving to the, to the community, it's also a way for our students to, to benefit. Any of these sorts of activities that, that allow them to connect their their academic experience with real world activities uh, is a huge opportunity for learning. Come back next week to learn more of the infinite opportunities at the state system's 14 universities or visit us online.